Hello, I'm Pastor Chuck Sostad, Senior Pastor of Center Points Christian Fellowship. Today, I'm continuing our study on the specific subjects of creation and the flood that are contained in the book of Genesis. Now, the book of Genesis is a historical account of, of the history and the events recorded in the opening chapters of Genesis, and actually, they occurred. They're, they're real events. It's history. And I'm in the process of explaining the various incorrect views of creation that are held by some people who theorize explanations about creation to fit their non-biblical teachings of secular uh, evolutionary science into the Bible. Now, some of these non-biblical teachings sound similar, and there are also some large discrepancies and differences. Now, studying the unbiblical Dage A theory is what I'm going to talk about today. See, although Moses wrote the book of Genesis approximately 3,400 years ago, it has been just the last few centuries when serious debate over the nature and the date of the original creation has developed. See, until the 18th century, Christians were virtually unanimous in the belief that the earth was about 6,000 years old, which it is, uh, and according to the teachings of Scripture. However, Increased secular scientific theorists began pressuring Christian thinkers to reevaluate the question of the age of the earth. Consequently, there are now several creation theories, and today we're going to look at what is called the day age theory. Now, this theory has several names, such as the day age, and the analogical uh, days, the intermittent days, of which the old earth creation holds to the current secular and non biblical scientific consensus regarding the age of the earth as about 4.5 billion years, as well as the age of the universe at about 13.7 billion years, which remember is all made up by men. However, old creation, uh, earth of creation that I've talked about is a broad term. Technically, every other uh, than the true correct biblical earth creation narrative of Genesis would fit into this view. Now, we've already looked at the gap theory, and that's an attempt to rectify a possible gap of undisclosed time between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, in which they say that God recreated what we know of the earth today after the first earth he created uh, billions of years ago became uh, ruined and you know was destroyed. And some of the gap theory adherents believe that it allows evolution to occur. Now, another theory of creation that we haven't looked at yet, but we will uh, in, in the coming weeks, is known as theistic evolution, which teaches that God used evolution as part of the creation process. Now, the same scientific problems addressed in dealing with the gap theory and the theistic uh, evolution theory are the same for the adherents of the day-age theory. Both of these theories uh, and actually all three, are an attempt to blend Darwinian evolutionary theory and scripture in order to sound palatable to some in the scientific community and the skeptics. You know, it's a way to fit in with the world system that in the end rejects the authority of the Bible and the existence of God himself. I mean, any theory, apart from what God has shown to us in his word, is nothing more than a compromise of belief and a demonstration of shame for the truth. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And Romans 1, 17 says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous one will live by faith. See, we need to believe in the word of God and live by it. Now, we're going to look now at the day age is viewed. It's also referred to as progressive creationism. See, progressive creation uh, teaches that the modern Big Bang theory of the origin of the universe is true and has been proven by scientific inquiry and observation, which is totally false and against what the word of God says because no human was there when God created the heavens and the earth. How could they use scientific methods of observation if they weren't there to see it? See, progressive creation, the day-age theory, teaches, uh, and I'll give this in a summation, is the Big Bang or origin of the universe occurred about 13 to 15 billion years ago. They say the days of creation were overlapping periods of millions and billions of years, and that over millions of years, God created new species as others kept going extinct. And the record of nature is just as reliable 
uh, as the word of God, they say. They also say death, bloodshed, and disease existed before Adam and Eve, which the Bible clearly says that is not what happened. See, they also said that man-like creatures that looked and behaved much like us and painted on cave walls existed before Adam and Eve, but did not have a spirit that was made in the image of God, and thus had no hope of salvation. Then they say that the Genesis flood was a local event, just as local flood, not a worldwide flood. See, progressive creation differs from theistic evolution, which we'll talk about later on too, is the idea that universal common descent accurately describes all of life, specifically with regards to humans. Now, under this view, they say that God entered into history at various times as an intervention into the timeline to create life and then allowed nature just to take its course. So they think it seems to be consistent with Genesis 1, where God is both actively creating and then allowing his creation to flourish for an indeterminate time frame before going to the next day of creation. Now, moreover, there could have been, they say, more of these interventions than those listed in Genesis 1-1 and 2 and so forth, because they say Genesis is not an exhaustive account of creation. Now, this is easily one of the most popular of current theories that the adherents call evidence, which of course it's not, uh, to reconcile secular scientific theories with God's word. And the Hebrew word for day, now this is true, in Genesis chapter 1, literally means a 24-hour day period. The day-age theory adherents take aim at the word day, which is yom, in Genesis 1, and change it to referring to it as a massive age of time. They feel that the literal reading of Genesis 1 for the Hebrew word yom has a wide semantic range and can refer to a long and indeterminate period of time, even billions of years. They say it can also refer to an indeterminate duration, and these theorists proclaim that a valid and proper understanding of the creation account will interpret each day as an era or age lasting a great length of time of thousands, millions, or even billions of years, represented by one day. Their view also allows for the interpretation that certain forms of evolutionary development may be true to, to please the evolutionists. See, man-made secular science has a habit of trying to disprove and contradict anything explicitly taught in the Bible. But God's word is our supreme source of truth. That's what we need to turn to. And it's important to, po it's important to point out that the day-age theorists are not attempting to remove God, although some alternative views such as atheistic evolution do, they do attempt to remove God uh, from the creation process, but the age day theorists say, oh, well, God's still there, he's just not active like we think he is. But see, rather the day age theory seeks to harmonize faithful interpretation of the Bible with a modern understanding of secular science. Now, needless to say, any approach to interpreting the Bible should be handled with caution. See, one consequence of questioning the fundamental truths of the book of Genesis is the temptation to reinterpret any doctrine that does not agree with their preferences. See, secular individuals that call themselves Christians that do not believe the Bible should be taken literally, but believe instead that Genesis chapters 1 through 11 are just fairy tales and myths, feel they are more enlightened to the truth than we are. See, many people who prefer to choose not to believe in those chapters of Genesis are found to also question the promise of the Savior, Jesus Christ, even his deity. They question the validity of Noah's uh, flood and the ark, uh, the division of languages because of the Tower of Babel, and the call of Abraham. See, however, preference is not a valid reason to reject the inerrancy, meaning without error, of the Word of God. By suggesting a different interpretation of the Bible that leads people to questioning the inspiration of the Bible, it pushes them into false teaching and into error. So what does the Bible say about time periods or periods of time? Well, in studying creation as a fact in the Bible and viewing the errors of secular theories of creation today, we need to understand the scriptural problems with the day-age theory. The first thing we see is that its proponents redefine the word day in Genesis 1 to, to the long periods of time. As I've stated, the Hebrew word for day is yom. 
The word is used 2,291 times in the Old Testament, and typically it refers to a literal 24-hour day. In Genesis 1, God defines the light and the dark cycle as morning and evening, which obviously it describes a literal 24-hour day. The terms evening and morning are used 38 times in the Old Testament and always refer to a 24-hour time period. In Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, God explains humanity's work week, defined as six days of labor and one of rest. See, he paralleled it with the same pattern he set during his creation work week, laboring six days and hallowing the seventh as a day of rest. So Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, speaks of humans working six days and then resting on the seventh day or the Sabbath. And the reason for this is God worked six days and then he rested. Now, if the Sabbath day were an indefinite long period of time, this commandment uh, would have been uh, meaningless to the Hebrews. See, the institution of the Sabbath on the seventh day, which if it was to be understood as an indefinite period, it would have had no meaning for man. They would not have understood it. The constant usage of this expression in scripture is to denote an ordinary day with the few exceptions of a poetical or oratorical diction, uh, the literal meaning which all commentators and Bible readers have assigned to it till within the last century or so are additional proofs that the biblical record has long purported uh, to intimate the expression yom as a natural 24-hour day. Also realize that God is not resting now. Although God had ceased creating the known universe as we see it right now, he's not resting, he's still working. Look at what Jesus answers the people trying to persecute him in John 15, in chapter 5, verse 17. He says, but he answered them, my father is working until now. I myself am working. See, mixing and matching literal days and indefinite periods of time in such parallel contexts would appear to be a desperate, a desperate attempt to promote personal ideology at the expense of scripture. It also is a faulty means of Bible interpretation. See, when the word yom is used in creation event, it means a 24 hour period and it's used specifically for their creation days. The Hebrews had words they could have used that would express periods that were longer than a day if that's what God wanted. See, Moses, the writer of Genesis, through Deuteronomy, through those books, used these words on other occasions. So there, there's a Hebrew word, moed. It's translated seasons in Genesis 1.14, which are longer than a day. Season is a longer period. Genesis 1.14 says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and they shall serve as signs for seasons and for days and years. Now the word olam, it's translated as forever in Genesis 6.3. Genesis 6.3 says, Then the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. This is you know, later on after the flood. Uh, the phrase olam dor is translated as all generations in Genesis 9.12. That verse says, God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. Now the word tamit is, is rendered continually in Leviticus 24.2. It reads, command the sons of Israel and that they bring to you clear oil from beaten olives for the light to make a lamp burn continually. Now the word uh, ad in, in Hebrew is translated in some versions as forever in Numbers 24, 20. Now the phrase yom orek, it means the length of days in Deuteronomy 30, 20. It says, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by holding close to him, for this is your life and the length of your days, so that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Now the phrase Yom Olam is translated as days of old in Deuteronomy 32.7. Deuteronomy 32.20, or excuse me, 32.20 says, By the loving your God, your, uh, the Lord your God, by obeying his voice and by holding close to him, for this is your life and length of days, so that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. 
See, if long ages were supposed to be understood in Genesis in the creation account, why was the word yom used rather than Hebrew words which indicate long periods of time if that's what God had done? No, he uses it as, as 24-hour days because that's what he did. The reason is because God literally created everything in six literal 24-hour days. If each day of creation somehow represents a period of undisclosed millions or billions of years, then we have to believe that Adam also lived that long. I mean, human beings have never lived that long millions or billions of years. I mean, even in the antediluvian pre-flood world of Adam and Eve's uh, time. Now, they lived a long time, you know, up to almost a thousand years, but the day age theory supporters believe the life evolved over billions or, uh, of years. The reason why the years of man was cut back was because after the flood, the whole earth was different. And that's another conversation that we'll have. But see, they teach that God guided this evolutionary process by intervening at critical stages when it became necessary to correct the mistakes that were generated through the natural selection. God doesn't make mistakes, and God didn't make a, a mistaken world. See, day-age theorists also believe that the geological column and fossil records are proof that Earth's history was laid down in uniform fashion, one period of time after another which is not true, which we'll talk more about when we talk about the flood. But see, they view this assumption as something that Christians must reconcile with their faith if they ever hope to be taken seriously by educated friends, neighbors, and colleagues. Well, that's not a reason to, uh, uh, to worry about. Let me tell you what. Standing on the word of God is not mankind's theories. I just have to say that as a believer in the literal interpretation of the Bible, as it is written, I have a hard time taking seriously any secular or if they call themselves Christians that do not believe in the Bible as it is written. When they take man-made theories and say this is the truth, then I can't take them seriously. Remember, secular science that doesn't believe in what the Bible states about creation has created a science out of their own thinking and has never proven their theories, no matter how many times they explain and say the same interpretation and say the words over and over and over again, it's their theorized ideas. It's not proven science. As a matter of fact, Corinthians 1, 18 through 25 tells us that God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. So to accommodate the suppositions of secular evolutionary science, the day-age theorists insist that the days of Genesis are not to be viewed as literal 24-hour days, but rather as six periods of extended time. And they say that each long period of time is essentially made to correspond to one of the six days of creation. And they say the order of creation, as presented in Genesis 1, think about this. They have a hard time with it because it does not agree with any type of evolutionary theory, and it blows their, their, their mind, it blows their theory out of the water. The day-age theory cannot accommodate both days of Genesis and the basic tenets of evolution. I mean, here's an example. We read in Genesis 1, 11 through 12, that God created plant life on the third day and the sun on the fourth. See, while plants may be able to survive one day without the sun, they certainly could not survive without the sun for long ages of time. So some of those who hold the age day interpretation believe that the days in Genesis are, are not in chronological order. See, that's another way to try to fix this thing. But are given topically. They say that this will explain why the sun, moon, and stars are not supposedly created until the fourth day, as well as the problems with plants and animals. <laughs> you know, however, once you change the chronology and make days overlap, then the text tells us nothing about the age of the earth. So here is something else to consider. A perfect God would not create imperfection. Why would God take so long a time to create everything? What purpose would it serve for God to delay his creation? I mean, we know that he has the power to speak and then things immediately appear. I've seen it personally in, in healings, miraculous healings. Why would he wait thousands, millions, or billions of years to create Adam and Eve? In Psalms 33, Psalms 104, and Hebrews 11.3, God spoke and his creative will was done instantly. 
If we can accept his miraculous power to heal the sick, raise the dead, or calm the sea instantaneously while rejecting his power to create in the same manner, it becomes an unnecessary and troublesome position for a Christian to maintain. It would also suggest that our our all-powerful God isn't powerful enough to create everything in the time frame that the Bible tells us he did. See, that's what they're they're trying to say. I mean, the supporters of the day-age theory seem determined they're determined to reconcile a supernatural creation with atheistic ideas of naturalism. And any accommodation of theory apart from what scripture records, it's a slippery slope that gradually leads to an abandonment of the biblical teachings about God's miracles in general and Jesus' miracles in particular. If we look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, it says, all scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. And 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21 says, And so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture becomes a matter of someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy ever was made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. See, the Bible is clear. It is clear that it is inspired by God through the Holy Spirit, and it needs to be understood in light of what what and how it's written and not by someone's opinion of what they think it means or what they can interject into it. It should be noted that this slippery slope of compromise or a downgrade of belief was the main reason uh, that the effectiveness of Christianity dwindled in the United Kingdom at the end of the 19th century. You know, Charles Spurgeon, excuse me, lived from 1834 to 1892. He fought so hard against this compromise that it damaged his health and was one of the factors that led to his early demise. The departure from a literal understanding of Genesis will ultimately cause problems. Adopting a non-literal view of creation and the narrative in Genesis is apparent that this is the first step in moving away from the view that Genesis records uh, history, that it's a historical record. Once it's admitted by people that the days of Genesis might not be ordinary days, but could be understood as long periods of time, it becomes difficult to maintain the historicity and the literal interpretation of other aspects of the creation account and the rest of the Bible, any doctrine they want to pick and choose. So are we counted among the preachers, the teachers, and the believers in these last days who are willing to fight for the truth of the gospel? Or have people become ashamed of it? as other, others have done already. Individuals who try to change the meaning and or doctrines of the Bible are trying to downgrade the biblical authority of the Word of God, and they're trying to do it today. So let's stand firm in what is recorded in the Word of God. It works better that way. It really does because it's the correct way to believe that the Bible is literally talking about what it's talking about. I mean, the war of the worldviews is not ultimately one of young earth versus old earth or billions of years versus six days or creation versus evolution, even those are a part of it. The real battle is the authority of the word of God versus man's fallible theories. And the real issue is one of authority. So we need to unashamedly stand upon God's word as our sole authority. Now, I'm going to close at this point. Today, but I hope this gives you a better understanding of what the age day theory is. Next week, we'll continue with our study on creation and the flood. And as we go through this, I think you'll have a better understanding of what the Bible really says we need to believe. So for now, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can come into your house. We can come into your place of worship. We can come in our study at home or wherever it is that we're listening. And we're studying the word of God together. I ask that you would help us as I always do, to be better students of the word, rightly dividing the word of truth, that we might show ourselves approved, that we might show a defense of the gospel, that we will show a defense of what we believe and what the Bible says. That we're not going to adhere to the ideals or the the theories of mankind, but we are going to believe what the Bible tells us because it is our source of truth. 
Lord, help us as we study and we go deeper into the word. I thank you for these things. Bless each one of us today and throughout this week in your precious holy name that we pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for joining in with me today for this teaching, and hopefully you'll continue joining with us. If you'd like to see more of our videos uh, that we've taught, both our, our my preaching messages and our teaching uh, messages, uh, all you got to do is go to www.youtube.com forward slash the at symbol CPCF forward slash videos. You can find them all there. You can sort through them. You can look at them that way. I've numbered all of the teaching and the, the preaching messages in, in numerical order. So you can tell that. It'll see, either say teaching or it'll say or, or sermons. And you can just look at that. Also, uh, you can find them on YouTube and on our, our the, the current ones are on our, our, our uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on Facebook. And you can also find them on the weekly one on our um, website. It's www. Uh, dot centerpoints.org all right and if you'd like to know more about uh, our getting a weekly newsletter on sunday mornings that tells what our services are for that week what our worship songs are and when we have our wednesday night thursday night by uh, thursday morning women's bible study wednesday night bible study for for everyone uh, you can find that information there if you'd like a link to our wednesday night bible study or the ladies for the wednesday or the thursday morning Bible study for women, uh, send me an email at info at centerpoints.org and I'll get back to you. I'll make sure you get a link for that. Uh, if you have any questions or you need prayer, uh, send me a, again an email at info at centerpoints.org. So until I see you again, stay safe and may God bless you and have a great day.